Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. And my guest, you know her. She's the one and only Rachel Hotmeyer. You can follow her on Twitter at Rachel Hotmeyer. Rachel, how the heck are you doing? I'm good. I'm here. Um, it, it just feels like a normal recording with you. It doesn't feel like this is the end of the Packers season. What? I don't know about you, but like on Sunday, all I wanted to do after a game, like I got to bed at like 5 a.m. Sunday morning after I did everything. I don't know what time you got in, but 3 a.m. 3 a.m. Yeah, 3 a.m. So yeah, it was 5 a.m. It's when I actually got everything done and went to bed. All I wanted on Sunday was just to sit and be a couch potato and just watch football all day. And I watched it, but it was begrudgingly at times and painful at times. And I know that you're like, you know, not a fan of Packers. However, I do know that a potential, you know, trip for you to LA was on the line. So I'm sure there was some pain there as well. Uh, but what were your just final takeaways from the end of the season? I've talked about it, you know, probably way too much the last few days. What were your thoughts on the ending of the season and their final game against the 49ers? The way I'll continually summarize this collapse was stunning, but not shocking. Um, I think that's the best way I could put it because at the end, their Achilles heels remain the same. None of this was a surprise. We've seen plenty of lackluster offensive performances from Rogers and company this year. And ultimately this was that on steroids, but it still happened. It was Aaron exploiting his connection with Devonte to the maximum, to the point that it was a fault and it took him way too long to try and, you know, hit anybody else in route. Um, you know, special teams has almost never been fixed. They were lucky to have the stop gap that David Moore was, but this was an issue that's been overlooked by coaches for way too long. Um, and, and ultimately players didn't execute any time ever on this. So, um, I, I can't say I'm shocked by the way this ended, but stunning is accurate. Um, yeah, I'm a little bummed to not be going to LA to cover a Super Bowl. That's a bucket list item to want to do. And I think many people hoped, you know, fans and people alike wanted this Packers seem to be in it and I would have been fortunate um, to cover that. So yeah, it, it's just interesting in reflection um, what I would have given to be inside at 1265 Lombardi for exit interviews would to really be a fly on the wall would be interesting. Exit interviews, the final, you know, well, obviously with LaFleur, but that final, uh, you know, discussion with the team in the locker room following the game, all of that. And I, I'm sure a lot of players in that, all the players in the locker room were absolutely gutted. Uh, by what happened. Um, you, you hit the nail on the head, right? A lot of these issues that came up in this game had reared their ugly heads. I don't know, like, I never really put this together until today. And I don't know exactly where I'm going with this, but it is like, I've been talking about Matt LaFleur, you know, 13 and three, 13 and three, 13 and four, technically, but really 13 and three, because that last game didn't really count. And, and you know, never had lost back-to-back -back games up until the point of losing to Detroit and San Francisco in these last two weeks. Um, but for all the incredible regular season performances that they have strung together over three seasons, they have yet to win two playoff games in a row. In fact, in three playoffs now, they have a total of two wins, which yeah. I'm no math They're major. Three. Yeah, exactly. Two and three. And I'm no math major, but in order to win a Super Bowl in any one season, at minimum, at minimum, you have to win three to win the Super Bowl, two to get there, three to win the Super Bowl. They've won two games in three years come playoff time. Now, clearly, the teams that you're facing come playoff time are much more difficult than what you're facing over the course of the regular season. But that's sort of the point. You have to be one of the if you want to be the best, you got to beat the best. And they have been unable to do that now for three years and regular season success is freaking awesome. And going basically what 39 and nine over three seasons is incredible. And like I, I, I said yesterday, Matt LaFleur deserves a ton of credit for what he's done with this franchise. I think green Bay is a million percent in the right hands. I am excited to see what he continues to do to lead this team moving forward, but those are some pretty poor playoff performances. And this was the worst yet. Yeah, I ultimately wonder, you know, if if fans and critics alike would consider Green Bay's playoffs of the past few years a success if the team had at least gotten to the Super Bowl and lost. What if the team had made it to back to back Super Bowls and lost? You know, would people be considering that a success because at least you're getting to the biggest stage, but maybe unable to beat the top team? I'm just curious about how different um, that is. But ultimately, two and three in playoffs, this isn't as bad, obviously, or anywhere close to 
Cliff Kingsbury's notable second half of the season slide, but right. it's certainly interesting that this team has been able to stack three great seasons together, setting themselves up for a postseason run. And every year the momentum seems stronger and the belief seems brighter that they're going far and they get in their own way. Um, and these haven't been, you know, endings of like the games we saw this past weekend with an incredible Mahomes Allen shootout. Um, these have been games that Green Bay has lost themselves. So it, it's been interesting to kind of look back and analyze what goes wrong. Yeah. And it, it's been a weird three losses in the playoffs because you had the game against San Francisco where they basically no showed that game. I know they put a little fight in at the end, but they basically no showed an NFC yeah. championship game, which was very, very odd. And then you had Tampa where they're down what, like 18 points to start the second half. And you had just bizarre, like Aaron Jones fumbles, which he never does to start the second half. You had the play before halftime with Kevin King, like just, you know, gut wrenching, brutal plays in that game, which were uncharacteristic of that team. And then you get to this year and you have one of your great defensive performances, probably the maybe the best defense one of the best to me yeah in in the in the three years that Matt LaFleur's been here I think that's probably their best defensive performance mm-hmm. and you can't win a game and there's a cat on camera that's she's amazing. been waiting to do this all season we finally get the cameo that we really wanted this is why people ask he's a Devonte Adams fan for the record she always pays attention um when he's speaking via laptop so for anyone out there who can get a a 17 small pet jersey I, I think I'd take it if now if Devante leaves, will she follow Devante or will she remain, you know, loyal to the green and gold? Yeah. Yeah. Just like there's players coaches. She's a, she's a player's fan. She takes after her mom. So yep, okay. she will. Um, she will, but she knows her roots. She came from green Bay humane society. So, um, you know, she'll, she'll always support the hometown team. Say hi. Oh, Jesus you have a new Christ. star of the show. <laughs> so I, I agree with you. Like, right. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Like, these are games that Green Bay has lost themselves ultimately. Um, and is this going to be the curse? Are we going to look back on this? I did a story last year about Wisconsin sports over the past decade, making it to like the, the, Bucks, the, broke that. the Bucks broke that. The, bro- the Bucks did break that. And you know what? Good for you guys. But um, it, it's interesting that, you know, what, what what's going to, what is it going to take um, to, to get over that hump, I guess, because they've had so many shots and this seemed like the shot that they were going to at least get over that hump and make it to the Super Bowls, And they got too cocky. Yeah. And I, w- I was thinking about that a little bit today because I, I think it's fair to say, and may- maybe something will shock me or surprise me. It wouldn't be the first time, but I think it's fair to say that if they do bring back Rogers and, and, you know, try to keep this team together as much as possible, I think you make a very strong argument that over the next couple of years, they're, it's going to be very difficult to put a team together as good as the team that they just had this year. And they couldn't get out. They couldn't win a playoff game. It However, was already difficult enough for them to put together a team this year to try and mimic the team last year. Agreed. And, and, and they somehow found a way. And I think they can find potentially a way again. It's going to take some luck and some better injury health and some things like that. But I think they can do that. But then I started also thinking of, if, if I go back and really think about it, I'm not sure that that 2010 team when they won the Super Bowl has been Aaron Rodgers' best team over the course of, you know, the, you know, however long he's been here and as the starter of Green Bay. Maybe it was, you can make an argument, but the, the, the best iteration of yourself isn't always the one that necessarily wins the Super Bowl and gets you to the top. It's, and, and even Aaron has talked about this at times is it's, it's, you know, hitting your stride at the right moment. It's team chemistry. It's all those sort of things. And I think that's also why this is frustrating because all of those things also seem to be coming together this season, but ultimately it just wasn't to be anything you want to else you want to touch base on there before we get to Matt LaFleur's final presser. Um, no, I think as much as we told Packers fans to like, enjoy what you had last year, I think that just rings even more true this year because no matter how many puzzle pieces and strings you try to pull and put together, um, you can't keep pushing off money forever. This isn't the MLB. This isn't the Orioles with Chris Davis's contract. Like you can't make that happen in this league uh, forever. There, there was already enough crazy maneuvering in the Bermuda Triangle of the Packers books. So I just think people really need to start preparing. I think my biggest question, just because I know we don't have it on the agenda, so maybe I'll just throw it out there now um, as a fun question. I've talked about this with a couple of people. If you look at maybe two of the the brightest, you know, big signings the Packers had this year. And the fact that Rasul Douglas and Devondre Campbell are both free agents now. Um, who do you think will be more expensive to retain? And 
who do you think is the right person of the two if the Packers can only pick one to keep? I think Devondre will be much more expensive than Razul will. And I, th- mm-hmm. I think the reason is because, I mean, when you have first team all pro next to your name and, you know, it, when you also play an entire season of football, the caliber that Campbell was able to play, I think that puts you a little bit more on teams radars. And I also think that while he struggled in previous situations, he's been a long-term starter in this league and now he seems to have figured it out. So yeah. he is a veteran. He has the size, the speed, the strength, the athleticism that is really ideal for that position. It is a very difficult position to find suitable players that can play on the field on all three downs. I think that is a bigger unicorn than what Razul Douglas is. And I think for Razul, there will still be the questions of, listen, he was great, but he was great for about eight, you know, eight to 10 weeks. And trust me, that's going to get him paid, but there will still be teams that say, I'm not going to empty my pocketbook for what could be just right situation, right time, playing some really bad quarterbacks in there when he gets it, you know? So I I think, I think GMs are going to say Devondre is much more, um, you know, important or much more valuable. And I think from a green Bay standpoint, for those, all those same reasons, I think Devondre is the right answer. However, as I was, as I tweeted out yesterday, and as I, as I watched the tape, especially of this game, that was our first glimpse of Douglas, Jair, and uh, Stokes on the field at the same time. And I want to see more of it uh, because that was really fun. And, uh, you know, Jair wasn't even himself yet, barely played, you know, like 10, I think less than 10 snaps. Yeah. But when those guys were on the field together, it had the ability to be a lockdown secondary. And that really excites me as well. And I think when you combine that with the fact that Razul is probably cheaper, that's probably where I would start. But I think Devondre is still the right answer if you could, you know, is in regards to who's more important for Green Bay. I completely agree with you, especially when you look at ultimately, yes, Shire wasn't himself in this last game, but given the surplus of corners they do have right now, they can make situations, whether it's fun or not, work with the secondary in order to keep that unit you know, as steady and consistently playing as they did this year. But with Devondre Campbell, I mean, it's just, I I think the bigger price tag is going to be worth it for the Packers. Yeah. And I mean, you look at it this way too, right? Like Razul leaves and you've got Stokes and Jair and you've got two amazing corners, Exactly. you know, Douglas or uh, excuse me, Devondre leaves and you've got Chris Barnes who has had his ups, um, but he's had some downs. And I think we saw in that Detroit game, missing Devondre really mattered. And Mm -hmm. I, I, you also Devondre calls all the plays like, I just think there's, listen, he was the last guy out of the tunnel uh, Mm -hmm. for that, for that game against the 49ers defense was announced. He was the last guy out of the tunnel. There's, there's a lot going on with what Devondre brings to this team. And I guarantee you green Bay wants him back. And it's just going to be, does the, is the price right? And and does it fit? So all going to be incredible things to watch this off season. What I I went over, you know, pretty much verbatim, a lot of the stuff that Matt LaFleur went over in his press conference yesterday, but uh, or two days ago, as people are listening to this, but anything that you had as a major takeaway from LaFleur's presser? Yeah, I don't know if I will ever um, not be laser focused on the point he's making about studies around the league regarding starters on special teams, because you had 18 plus weeks to look at that around the league and try it yourself before losing a starter to injury in the biggest game of your season so far. So do I think that this is a little too late? Yes. Do I think he was out called and out coached? Yes. But I'm interested in, I guess, what he comes up with. And we're going to have to wait to see until next year when we see some of that in action. But, you know, there are ways to have starters playing that aren't AJ Dillon, like a very key part of your second half offense. Um, you could have had Alan Lazard out there blocking. Like there, there are so many other options you could have had Randall Cobb for Christ's sake. Like the, again, I just think it it's very interesting that this problem really seems to be hitting them and publicly admitting it at the very last second. Here were the top 19 players that played on special teams this year for green Bay. All right. Top 19 players. In order, tell, like number one. Yep. From one to 19. You tell me if this is a team that you would want to field. All right. In any, in any capacity. Yeah. Or, Oren Burks, Henry Black, Isaac Yadam, Ty Summers, Tyler Davis, Shamar Jean Charles, Isaiah McDuffie, Mason Crosby, Tyler Lancaster, TJ Slayton, Corey Bajorquez, 
Josiah DeGuara, Dean Lowry, Malik Taylor, Chris Barnes, Dominique Daphne, Amari Rogers, EQ, Jonathan Garvin. Those were the top 19. Those are fringe at best roster players. Now, the fact not, that Yadam in the top five is an, even as of now resigned. Not, not on the team at the moment, right? So these are very fringe roster players for the most part. Like DeGuar is going to be around. You're going to have Dean Lowry is obviously more than a fringe roster player, but a lot of these are players that are not, you know, are, are the bottom of your roster. And those are the guys that you are saying to Mo Drayton, here's your 19 guys that you get to go out and have on special teams. And they're focused on so much else other than special teams. I'm not saying everybody in this league is lucky enough to have a Matthew Slater or something like that. These career right. special teams guys. However, you cannot openly internally be treating this like bottom of the barrel stuff. Yep. You can't act like special teams is just the vehicle for making the roster in a more explosive way because special teams is a pivotal part of your game. And as we've seen, if you F it up enough, uh, F it up enough, it'll kill you. And, and here's the thing too, right? I know that people are like, well, you know, and we saw AJ Dillon get hurt on special teams, right? They play AJ Dillon out there and he gets hurt and it affects the game plan in the second half. There's a risk to be had there. However, there are, there's one, there's risk on every play, but two, there's different situations. Let, let, let's take the blocked punt by, um, by the 49ers in this game by Willis. Could you not have Rashawn Gary for a player to try that same thing to rush up the middle and bull rush a long snapper or somebody exactly. that's 240 pounds back into the punter. I'm not saying you need to do it on every play, and but you know, maybe, maybe in a playoff game in a, in a, you know, perfect moment to do something like that. And, and here's the other thing too, right? the odds that Rashawn Gary rushing up the middle to try to block a punt is going to get hurt in that scenario. Like that's something that he's doing on every play. It's not like you're asking him to all of a sudden be like the lead blocker on kick return because yeah, there's no difference between that and every other snap he took leading up to it. Exactly. So like, I do think that there are some low hanging fruit opportunities to say, Hey, you know, maybe it's not on kick returns. Maybe it's, you know, there's certain other situations that maybe aren't the most ideal for some of our, our star players to be out there for, but in some situations, whether it be maybe a a field goal block opportunity, a punt block opportunity, some things like that, we're going to keep these guys, you know, a couple of these guys out there to give us a chance to maybe make a big play in the game, because I'm I'm telling you those top 19 guys that I just mentioned, those are not playmakers. Those and are ultimately, not- when you're in these positions, why aren't you looking to make yeah. a big play? Why is your playbook telling you to just coast by with the bare minimum of these fringe guys? Why aren't you looking to make explosive game changing plays in these opportunities like other teams have been able to take advantage of multiple times against you? And it, it, it just shows the difference. And I think you bring up a, a perfect point there. And the fact that like Amari Rogers in this game, I don't know if he was coached this way, but it almost felt that way get the ball and get out of bounds. He like almost every time to a T was like, just get, just catch the ball and get out of bounds. Don't try to do too much. That's what this special teams has felt like as a whole all season long, just try not to fail instead of let's go out and succeed. And I think that's a huge mindset change. And if you want to talk about a special teams that needs a complete 180 in regard, they needed to have a coach come in and a philosophy for this entire special teams of this is not a unit that we are going to try to just not lose us the game. We need to make this a unit that can actually help us win football games. Exactly. And, you know, going back to, I know this is a long time ago now, but 96, they don't win that Super Bowl without Desmond Howard. You My know, birth so, year. what's that? My birth year. Yeah, there you go. You know, I know you followed that team very closely that year. So uh, <laughs> they don't win that Super Bowl without the, the efforts of Desmond Howard. So um, I don't know. You just have to make it a, a much more important than it is right now. And I think that's abundantly clear. And I think that's a fantastic takeaway from Matt LaFleur's presser. Want to move on because Cheesehead TV did a really great interview with David Bakhtiari and uh, we're able to get some of the answers as to what went on. I'm not going to spill everything because I want everyone to be able to go and check that out over on Cheesehead TV. Uh, but just a couple of quick things really quick. He said, everyone knows I tore my ACL. What people don't know is that it wasn't just an ACL or just wasn't just an isolated tear. Um, sorry, my screen's being weird here. I had a little bit of a meniscus and I got a little bit of cartilage. There was a lot going on. Um, you and I were talking about this before, but all the fluid that he had in his knee said it felt like a water balloon. He had his knee drained about 15 times throughout the season. He had more procedures done, more fluid drainings. 
Um, and that's of course, he, right. That that's of course why he wasn't able to come back is because his knee just never recovered fully. And he had to keep having it drained and have more procedures done. However, he did sort of end things with saying that his ACL is good and his meniscus is good. He just needs his knee to rest so that it stops having all this fluid and everything like that. So hopefully good news for David Bakhtiari moving forward, but any other takeaways that you had from that interview with David? It's just shocking. And I think we were all starting to surmise that something up was up way more than just that typical scope he had, you know, a couple months back. Um, we could all kind of gather that he wasn't on certainly the original timeline, let alone even the updated one that you thought from just that scope. Um, it was interesting when taking that information with Lafleur's answer to a question of if it was a mistake to play Bakhtiari for those 27 snaps. So now you really wonder, was it fatigue in that situation or was his knee just unable to kind of bear that weight and take, you know, the play. So ultimately, fatigue. right. Um, so it ultimately, you know, you don't want to see these guys, you know, playing through pain, even though we know that happens all the time. Um, and, and you just well wishes for that big man's knee. And what's crazy is when he played those 27 snaps in Detroit with a water balloon for a knee that wasn't bending the right way or doing anything, he still looked freaking awesome. Absolutely. Like that's, that's how talented that he is at that position that he has a, you know, a really major issue on his knee, um, which is going to, you know, limit his mobility and his movement. And he's still just an absolute stud at the position. It's just crazy how talented he is and zero question that his loss was felt immeasurably over these last two playoffs and may have changed the fortunes for the Packers in those Absolutely. two playoff runs based on his absence and just, not fun, but you got to overcome those things. We had some transactions on Tuesday, which I want to get to. Uh, we had 10 players that were signed to reserve future contracts. That included Kirk Benkert, KB Anento, Innes Gaines, Ladarius Hamilton, Michael Manet. I think it's Manet, maybe it's Manette, uh, JJ Molson, Cole Van Lannan, and Ray Wilborn. All 10. And quarterback Danny Etling. Hold on, hold on. I was getting there. So all of those, uh, excuse me, those eight that I just mentioned were all just on the Packers practice squad. So all eight of those were on the Packers practice squad recently. Danny Etling and Chris Blair, they also added to reserve future contracts. Etling uh, was on the practice squad earlier this season, as was Chris Blair for a huge chunk of the year. They bring both of those guys back as well. So of those 10, and I want to talk a little bit more about Etling in a second, but of those 10, is there anyone that stands out more to you? Cause there's one that definitely stands out more to me. Um, I mean, I guess when you look at this as a whole, it, you know, you have to think, is this the Packers saying, okay, if Rogers is gone, it's, it's love banker at Etling. Like this is our one, two, three. Um, and, and they're comfortable with that. It would be interesting to see if the Packers, became a four QB um, situation that would still be shocking as well. Um, no, who's standing out to you and why? I, JJ, I don't know. JJ Molson for sure. Sure. Is standing out to me. Um, Cause I don't think there's any chance that Mason Crosby, Mason Crosby's not back on his current contract. No, I don't think he's back at all. I think he probably, I don't think so either. I think he probably retires would be my guess. Um, and again, because ultimately when you look at what, the kicking unit did this year and we're not here to place blame on this now whether it was crossy whether it was the spin whatever ultimately the production that they were able to put out this year you can get for a fraction of a cost and that's just the reality of the situation yeah. if this is where we're at there's no need to keep paying the way you are and they are going to have to do a lot of fractions of costs at different <laughs> positions and that could easily be one of them and listen they've liked jj molson for some time they protected him um, almost the entire season they've kept him on the practice squad all year uh, he looked great, I thought, in training camp, mini camps, et cetera. So um, I, I think that is the one, if, uh, if I'm keeping an eye on someone as like a potential, like who has a real, real great chance of being like a legitimate player moving forward. To me, it's J.J. Molson. I think even if Crosby does go, as we're sort of expecting, I would be shocked if they didn't bring in competition for Molson. But Molson's going to be, to me, probably the leader in the clubhouse going into 2022 uh, as the, as the kicker. So I think that's yeah. a big one going back to Danny Etling for just a second. I am intrigued on that one because the Patriots did try him at wide receiver in the past and he has done some position flips. Then he's gone back to quarterback. So he, when he was in green Bay on their practice squad, he was there as a quarterback, but just a little bit interesting that 
if they wanted to go in a different direction, he does have, you know, he's not Taysom Hill. Nobody's really, I was right there. maybe get a little Taysom Hill and maybe there. a little bit of, you know, some of that too, or, you know, he's got some of that athleticism. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to try a player like him and maybe see what you can get out of that, but I'll, I'll be interested to see how they list him. And if they try him at anything other than quarterback, or if he's just a pure quarterback as well. And again, it's such a rare breed to see a hybrid last this long as a hybrid um, in the league um, in terms of going back and forth between quarterback and not. You see some guys come out of college that were quarterbacks and will convert to a wide out or a tight end just to make it in the league. And then they'll stick with that position that might be floated around on special teams a little bit. But ultimately, once you're converted out of quarterback, the most you're getting is being put on the emergency depth chart again. So um, in most cases, but I think this is exciting. You know, I, I'd love to see, again, you guys want to keep following up on that creative play calling. That's your shot. Yeah, you could, you never know. You never know what Matt LaFleur is going to bring out next. Uh, they also reportedly, uh, and I believe it was Bill Huber who reported this, um, are also going to sign Rico Gafford. Uh, he's a 4 40 guy. He's also had some versatility, played some wide receiver, some defensive back, and some special teams. Likely would come in as a wide receiver. Also spent his rookie training camp with the Tennessee Titans when Matt LaFleur was there. So LaFleur has some familiarity with him. He has had a cup of coffee in actual regular season play. Um, so that is another player to keep an eye on that was assigned to a reserve future contract as well. There are also some players that were notably absent from Green Bay's transactions on Tuesday, one of which Isaac Yadam, Bill Huber, also reported that he will not be back with the team. So that does it for Isaac Yadam, at least for now, and it sounds like they don't have plans to bring him back. But there was another group of players uh, who, you know, theoretically, there's been no report that they won't be back, but it was at least telling that they were not brought back as of yet. The biggest name probably is Jack Heflin, who was on the regular season active roster almost the entire year, then re- was released at the end along with Yadam in order to make room for both Zadarius Smith and Whitney Merciless. He was not signed to a futures deal. It could be that Heflin is looking for maybe different options. We'll see. It very well could be that tomorrow or as you're listening to this, maybe they've you know signed him and just worked out something different with the contract. Who knows? But he was not on that list. Another interesting one was Ben Braden, who going back to training camp and mini camps was thought to be in a, you know, the running for a starting spot. Then he gets released, added to the practice squad, moved back up a couple of times, but he was not resigned. Others were Kareth White, Josh Malone, David Moore, of course, we talked about earlier, Bronson Kafusi, Abdullah Anderson, who played uh, probably, I think the most snaps of anyone on this list this season, he even played more than Jack Heflin did. Yeah, Adam's probably the most, but anyway, I digress. Yep. Uh, RJ McIntosh, who they actually protected going into that last game against the 49ers and then linebacker Peter Kalambayi uh, as well. So definitely some players that at least as of this point, they also did not bring back. Yeah. It's, you know, obviously Cole Van Lannan, you know, has already signed in that 10. So, you know, it was interesting um, re- regarding Braden. Uh, again, I think it, this is just one of those weird weeks where anything could be happening. Um, the Packers also announced things at weird times um, and their, their mm-hmm. schedule is very much on their own. So they could have just said, all right, let's put something out there. That's positive. Um, you know, that this might not be any indication, um, or it might be, and we will only know when more news comes out. Did you get a chance to listen? I forgot to talk about this earlier, but did you get a chance to listen to Rogers on McAfee on Tuesday? Um, no, I did not. Okay. I'll just cover really quick. I, I, I'll, I'll actually get your thoughts next week on it, but after listening to it, um, I, I lean more towards him coming back just after listening to that. But as I've said all along, I think this thing could ebb and flow a million different directions. Yeah. And like, if you would have asked me this morning, is he coming back or not? I'd be like, I'm not sure. I don't feel it. And then after listening to that, I'm like, yeah, I think he might. And then a new report could come out tomorrow and I'd be like, Oh, he's not coming back. And then I just think ultimately like based on what he has said, what other people close to him have said over the past year, I don't think anything that's being said publicly is any true indication. Um, mm-hmm. You know, people are saying things to fill time and to cover up whatever the situation is. All parties are. And we'll never truly know what the relationship is like. All of this stuff about like a combative and, and you know, bad relationship comes out and we see them talking at practice. So things have improved. You know, we could say relationships are good and maybe they're bad again. Like we just don't know. We are not any of the people in this relationship. And normally, like that's not a big deal. People in sports talk about players and admin relationships but ultimately i just think there's so much media involvement and pressure in this situation and magnifying glasses on it that anybody 
Rogers included can be saying anything about this and it might just not be true, but everybody here knows how to play the game. So it's just kind of a wait and see. Unfortunately, Rachel, because the season's over, uh, probably my numbers for pack a day are probably going to take a little bit of a hit. So I have two options. I either have to start making up reports about Aaron Rodgers, or you and I have to do like the, the skip Bayless, Stephen A. Smith, and just start uh, going back and forth. I don't know which at, one's worse at the top of our lungs. So, uh, I'm still deciding. I'll let everyone post below in the comments if they'd rather which would have you me rather hit. like, yeah. Would you rather have me, uh, you know, according to sources reports uh, about Aaron Rodgers' future uh, or uh, me and Rachel yelling at each other nonstop for 30 minutes. Because, I mean, if the people vote that way, I'll do it. Yeah, we'll have to do it. I think if the people ask for it, we have to do it. So, all right, a couple other really quick things. Sean Payton out in New Orleans. The Bears find their GM, Ryan Poles, Chiefs Assistant Director of Player Personnel. And they also seemingly have three potential finalists for head coach. They have three that are coming back or either have come or are coming back for second interviews including Dan Quinn, Matt Eberflus, the Colts defensive coordinator, and Jim Caldwell, former Detroit Lions and Indianapolis Colts head coach. Any thoughts on any of that? I know I'm throwing a ton at you, but any thoughts on the, the state of the league and all the head coach openings? Um, it's interesting, again, that New Orleans being open is a huge opportunity because you have quarterbacks signed there. I mean, you have Taysom Hill signed through, I believe, at least 24, if not 25. Um it's just an incredible opportunity to get right in with a team that, that has pieces to, to make and stack wins. So that's an interesting opening to add to the landscape. I'm excited uh, for the Ryan Pohl story. It's so awesome. You know, signs with the bears, however many years ago um, as an undrafted free agent, and now is coming as the GM, what an incredible career arc. And I think it's awesome to see players, you know, continue careers in the sports space beyond their playing days, because that's what it's all about. We all know that playing is such a small fraction of these people's lives. Um, so it's exciting. You know, um, it, it's so interesting when so much of the sports news is bigger than the games itself that are still going on. Like we are still in playing season and yes, the games this weekend were obviously explosive. Um, I'm excited to watch Mahomes Allen rivalry for the rest of time, but like the bigger news right now is anybody, but those teams. Yeah. I mean, NFL is King, right? Like there's, there's nothing that goes on that isn't a huge piece of news, you know, with nine head coach openings over a quarter of the league has a head coach opening, you know, GM openings that, you know, arguably Brady and Rogers could potentially retire, which would change the landscape of the league entirely. Like there's everything is going on. And then because the season goes later than ever this year, the, the gap between Super Bowl and free agency is going to be smaller than ever. And then free agency is going to start before you know what the draft's going to be here. And it's going to be rookie, you know, mini camp. So uh, it's going to go crazy fast. And especially with all, like maybe the biggest shock of everything head coach opening for me right now is that there have been nine openings and not a single one has filled as of recording of this. Usually, yeah. usually there's a couple that are just like warp speed. Right. Like they get, they get filled right away. And maybe some teams are looking, you know, obviously Brian Dable, well, no, Brian Dable just got eliminated. So maybe, right. uh, you, you know, Eric Bieniemy or, you know, some of these coaches for yeah. um, that are still in it are in, you know, major consideration and they want to see those you know right. interviews first, but it's crazy that nine, nine openings and not a single one filled left yet. Yeah. And I saw some chatter about, you know, maybe the, the polls and Caldwell tandem could be really good yep. for the bears. So I think, right. I mean, by the time this posts or even in the coming days, some of those could be, but it's also funny how you see like in Minnesota and Chicago, them wanting to get the GM situation fixed first so they can Just, contribute to the head coaching discussion. Which is smart. I, am, I was yep. hopeful that the, the bears and Vikings would find ways to screw that up and, you know, maybe have it an arranged marriage that doesn't work and, you know, com, you know, complete another arranged marriages ever work. Yeah, no, they don't think so. So uh, yeah, but we'll see what they end up with. Hopefully I, I have faith that the, those two teams can still find ways to yeah. screw this up, even if they haven't so far. So Rachel, phenomenal stuff as always. We can follow you on Twitter. I know at Rachel Hotmeyer, what are you working on? What should we know about? Tell us anything new. Um, it's Olympic season now, um, working for an NBC station. We're all really focused on the Olympics. So I'm excited. A Wisconsinite surprisingly just got added to an unexpected Olympic team today. So excited to share stories like that. It's crazy. You know, in Wisconsin, you have great pro teams, but there's just a lot of stories around here. So, um, you know, you can always find me for those. I'm still going to be talking football year round. So I'm always here to talk about the Packers. What would have been your Olympic sport if you were an Olympian? Um, hmm. Hmm. 
this is I think I would have to have done curling. Like, I, I, I feel like I was going to say curling because, like, it'd be so funny and you don't have to be that athletic for right, it. Exactly. That's the but I played thing. sports growing up. I played softball and tennis and volleyball. Um, but I, I don't really want to do volleyball Olympically. Tennis was my strong suit. I played tennis for a long time and still play tennis. Um, and I'm like the best intramural softball player you'll have. So, um, but Olympic wise, I always love that they call it like athletics or whatever, when it's track, but it's athletics. I do athletics. So maybe I would have done that to sound posh, but I can't run. So what about you? Curling? Yeah. I mean, curling would work. That sounds good. I don't need to do anything else other than that. Okay. Probably die doing just about anything else. Luge, maybe some luge, just go down the hill super fast. Some bobsled. (laughs) All you have to do is lay there, though. So who would make who would make last who would make the ultimate Packers uh, reporter bobsled team? Four per, four people. You have to put together a bobsled team. Who are you? Who are you drafting to your bobsled team? Um, what is the point of how do you? How, okay, what makes a good bobsled? I guess I have no idea. I have no idea. Am I picking short people? Am I picking people I want to be stuck with on a sled? Am I picking heavy people? Am I, think I, need, like, I think you need somebody strong on the back to be able to like get you going in the first place. And then I think who's ever steering has to be like really freaking like arms and everything. And I don't know, maybe everyone steers. I don't know. But I think there's at least a couple of positions that have to be strong. I think everyone needs to be fairly aerodynamic. Um, so I don't know. Okay. I have no idea how to pick this. Um, (laughs) the four people I sit with, the people I sit with in the press box in my little assigned rows, it's, it's Dave Schrader of BAY, MK Burgess. I don't know how this happens because it's not in alphabetical order. And then me and then Lance Allen of TMJ. So that's been my row. And then a few seats over is Andy, obviously on the other side of this hallway. So um, if we had to sit by row, that'd be very interesting. Cause I don't know if all of us would fit on a sled, um, but you know, there were, there's enough girls on the beat that we could probably make two Bob sleds. Um, if not almost three, I think there's nine or 10. So we could probably make two women on the Packers beat teams and compete. That would be fun. I'm all in for that. Rachel, amazing stuff. I can't t- wait to talk to you next week. We'll definitely be following your Olympic coverage closely. Love you on your package Packer coverage. Easy for me to say. We will see you next week. I will be here tomorrow. Make sure to go out and subscribe. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.